everything's going great with you. Uh, the last time that we met, uh, we took a quiz and uh, we were talking about the information in section 5.2. Uh, today, we're going to talk more about how um, erosion happens and how wind and water can actually help with that erosion, uh, the movement of materials, and the deposition or the dropping off of those materials, how it can create certain things and how it can change the surface of the earth. So uh, let's start by let's start by looking at our agendas. Um, so if we could get that put into our uh, assignment notebook, um, it's not a lot as far as what you have to write down. Um, we are going to take uh, notes from section 5.3. And then we are going to um, complete this portion uh, out of our book, um, or a good. It's going to be a worksheet that goes along with it um, that just has four questions on it. Uh, these are questions from the book. We'll get to those at the end of the notes today. So um, there are going to be a lot of notes. Uh, I don't have any fill in the blank uh, notes for you, so uh, feel free to pause it. Uh, and uh, write down what you need to write down. Uh, there is quite a bit, but hopefully you were uh, able to make your flashcards like I like we did the last time. Um, and hopefully you uh, read through section 5.3. So you, you're going to have an idea of what we covered or what we're going to cover today. So um, let's take a look so in your notes. If you could please title this with today's date. And it is section 5.3, um, Waves and Wind Shape Land. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Now, one thing we have to understand is that uh, every time a wave crashes against the shoreline, it wears down a rock uh, every time. Uh, when you think of Lake Michigan, uh, there are waves coming and hitting that shore almost every single day, 24 hours a day. And as those waves come in, they are bringing other pieces of sand with it. And that sand and that water will hit those rocks and they will break off just slight little pieces of it every so often. Uh, and it will continue to just break down and, and smooth out uh, some of the rocks that you see on the, along the sidewalks out here uh, by the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade hallway. Uh, you'll see that they are rounded rocks. Well, many of those rocks were taken from shorelines, um, and uh, the waves had worn away that. So hopefully uh, you have to keep that in mind as, as one thing that we uh, that will apply to everything that we'll kind of talk about from this point on. So hopefully you you jot that down. Uh, pretty much the rule is if it's been highlighted, write it down. Uh, and if you have to pause it, pause it and get caught up. Or you can be just listening to this on your own and you can pause it on your own. Uh, that's up to you. So the first word that we are going to come across is is this right here, and it's in the blue highlight. Uh, it's called longshore drift. And when you read about longshore drift, uh, you will, uh, you found out that it is really just how beaches actually move. And it's really hard to believe that a beach can move and can be moved, but it really does happen. Um, it is the zigzag movement of sand along the, the edge of a beach. So make sure you jot that down. Uh, in your book on page 159, uh, there is a picture. Uh, so if you, after you get that jotted down, if you could please turn in your book to page 159, and I'd like you to draw this picture, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll put me back up there so you can actually see it. Um, Um, it's this picture.
right there. If you could draw that picture into your notebook. And while you're drawing that picture, I'll kind of explain what's happening in that picture. And I've, I've written it down into, the, into your notes. Uh, so I'll go back to those. Basically, what's happening is, as those waves, those red-lined waves are coming into shoreline, into the shoreline, uh, they're coming in at a certain angle. And that angle is determined by the direction of the wind. And so, as those waves are coming in, they are bringing materials with them. Particles, little sand things, little, little pieces of sand. And when they hit the shoreline, or when they hit the, uh, uh, the shoreline at an angle, they, they take that sand that they're carrying and it crashes along the shoreline and breaks up some of those rocks. By, and by break up, I mean they just break up little tiny, tiny, tiny pieces. Uh, and then that, wet, that wave then pulls that water and sand straight back into the water. And then the next wave comes in at an angle and it hits the beach at that angle. And then it pulls straight back again. And it just process just keeps on happening over and over and over again. And eventually that, that sand just moves from one side of that picture. If you're looking at your picture, starts on the uh, right side and it moves the sand to the left in that picture out of your book on page 159. So it's called a longshore drift for a reason because along that shore, that sand is drifting in one direction. And you can see the zigzag mo movement because as the waves are bringing that sand in at an angle, it goes in at an angle, but it comes straight back out, not at that same angle. And then it gets pushed back in at an angle and then right back out. So as it goes in, it's going in. As it goes in, it's going in straight. Excuse me, it's going in at an angle and then it comes back straight. And then it goes in at an angle and it comes back straight. So again, it goes in at an angle, comes back straight, goes in at an angle, comes back straight, goes in at an angle, comes back straight. Uh, that's that zigzag movement of sand. And it so basically as it's drifting down and the shoreline, it does that uh, day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. Uh, and it just keeps on happening. So when you look at your notes, uh, that's kind of what I said right here. Um, and this is kind of what longshore drift is. I'll be posting some videos uh, on a document at, at a later date uh, that kind of shows how um, longshore drift works. Uh, do you have to copy this down? It probably is not a bad idea. Um, it's probably if you copied the picture down in the book uh, and you put down the captions in that picture in the book, uh, that really does a, a, a nice job explaining it. So um, again, if you're looking at that picture right there, you can definitely see they've got the two captions, one and two. Those are telling you how it's all working. The red arrows are the waves coming in. The blue arrows are something called the longshore current, which then pushes the, the waves and the sand down the beach. So if you copy that picture and the captions, uh, I think you should be okay uh, as far as this part of your notes right here. So um, make sure you got that down. The next term 
is something called longshore current. Longshore current is the movement of the water along the shore. So if when you're thinking about that picture that you drew, it's the blue arrows in that picture. Um, when you look at when you look at that picture again, the longshore current are these blue arrows right here. That's just showing that it's moving along the shore in that direction. Now, when those waves hit the shoreline, before they hit the shoreline, they hit that longshore current. And that's the, the thing that turns the waves at an angle. It, so the waves, when they hit the shoreline, aren't usually hitting them straight on. It's usually uh, at an angle one way or the other. And the thing about the, the uh, longshore current is that it can change from day to day. Depending on which way the wind is blowing, uh, the waves may come in from left to right, or the waves may come in from right to left, uh, depending on that, that day, depending on which direction the, the wind is blowing. Uh, so longshore current is needed for longshore drift to actually occur. Now, longshore drift, and you can get this. This actually is it's just quite an amazing thing that a whole beach can be moved. And it has happened after storms. Um, after storms, where the waves are big and, and because the wind is blowing, uh, whole beaches can be moved 200, 300 yards down the shoreline. And that's because of this longshore uh, drift, this longshore current, this zigzag movement of sand. As the waves come in, they take a little bit of sand with it and they move it back and they move that sand a little bit farther down because of that longshore drift. So as you're jotting that down, longshore drift moves large amounts of sand along a beach. Um, it actually can cause a beach to um, shrink because it's moved the sand that was on that beach further down. Now, some places will put rocks out in the, on the shoreline uh, to try to stop that from happening. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they, they put in uh, these things called, um, they're called groins, G-R-O-Y-N-E-S. Uh, they're basically just a, a line of rocks starting from the shoreline and just moving out and they do a lot of them. Um, so it kind of, oh, here's my expert drawing here. So get ready. Um, so if, if you think of, okay, the, uh, the shoreline right here looks like this. Uh, all they really do is they, they put rocks kind of going out and going out and going out and going out like this so that when the waves come in and that that longshore current tries to push the waves in this direction. The water's coming in, in this direction. They hit that and they turn at an angle like this. When they hit the shore, they go straight back out. But since they put these outcroppings of rocks, that sand doesn't move over into the next section. It just stays right here. So the waves are still coming in. They hit the longshore current they bend, they hit the shoreline. That's when they hit the shoreline, they pick up sand and that sand is brought back. And then the next wave comes in and it hits that longshore current and it bends at an angle uh, and then it brings it back. And then when it tries to bend back here, it hits those rocks and it drops off right here. Um, it doesn't move into this next section. So the beach doesn't move forward. 
Uh, I know. Uh, great drawings. Uh, yeah. I do classes on the weekend sometimes. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, I could I could set you up with uh, a couple drawing lessons if you're interested. Uh, some of you might be interested in drawing lessons like that. Uh, some of you, most of you, almost every one of you uh, are probably way better than I am when it comes to drawing. So um, maybe if you have time, get that copy down. Uh, if not, we can get moving on. Uh, I don't think there's much more than this. Um, there's just this page right here. And with this page, I'm going to uh, kind of pull up the the uh, the barrier here so that you can see this. So uh, the next two terms you need to put down into your notes are these two right here. Something called a sandbar, which probably should be on one of those flashcards that you uh, created. And the other one's called a barrier island. Uh, a sandbar you probably have heard of or even... Uh, been on before in in a lake or a river. Uh, it's when sand builds up on the bottom of the river uh, because of a or uh, at the near the shoreline uh, because of the water being the water carrying sand in a river or the waves carrying sand in, uh, near a lake uh, gets dropped off uh, in a certain spot and they start to build up in that spot um, and there's a sandbar builds up. Uh, I know when I was young, uh, we had a lake in my hometown and there was, it was pretty deep in most places, but there was one area uh, that had a sandbar. And so we would take the boats out to the sandbar uh, and we put up a volleyball net on the sandbar and we could play volleyball, which was really kind of fun because uh, you, you, you couldn't really see where the out of bounds was, but you knew where the out of bounds was because when you were running after the ball, eventually that sandbar drops off into deep water. That was the out of bounds. So like you would be running towards the ball and all of a sudden the bottom of the lake would drop off and the sandbar would drop off and then you would sink. You knew that that ball was out of bounds uh, at that point. Um, so sandbars usually happen along in rivers and uh, along the shorelines. Uh, I know Lake Michigan has a lot of sandbars. Uh, I remember going up to a state park when I was a kid, somewhere along the, the uh, uh, coastline of Lake Michigan here in, in Wisconsin. And um, I remember swimming from sandbar to sandbar to sandbar. And I remember being 300, 400, 500 yards out from the, sh from the beach and my parents were like, hey, go ahead, have fun, have fun out there. You know, look at those kids are having a great time. Now, there was no way that they could get to us if we had a problem. And really, it was like a sandbar where the water was only about two or three feet deep. And then the water would drop off to 15 feet deep. And then another sandbar would show up and be about three or four feet deep. And then it would drop off to another 20 feet. And I, I think about what my parents were doing at that time, and and there's no way, there's no way I would I would do that with my kids. There's no way that I could get to them if they got in trouble that far out. And and my parents were like, "Hey, go ahead, have a good time out there." Uh, and uh, I guess it was just different times, uh, different times. I guess so. Uh, the next word was a barrier island. A barrier island is simply just a really big sandbar uh, that builds up right alongside a coastline, usually uh, in, in oceans. Uh, there are barrier islands off the coast of uh, most of the east coast of the United States. Um, and these barrier islands have turned out to be very valuable places. Uh, and I don't get it, but they, they do, you know, people build these million dollar homes on these islands uh, that are right off the coastlines, you know, maybe about, you know, 100 yards, 300 yards, a mile out from the coastline. Uh, these barrier islands are built up because of, of waves and wind dropping off sand on these, in these little areas and making these huge uh, sandbars, these barrier islands. And these barrier islands, uh, main thing that you have, you have to remember are that they do run parallel to the shoreline. So, so, um, all right, drawing time again. Yeah. 
So if you have um, the shoreline right here, a barrier island would be just a big island that kind of forms parallel parallel to the shoreline right here. So if the shoreline is right here, this is a big island that forms along here. Now, again, they're building multi-million dollar uh, homes on these islands, which I get, I guess. I, I said I didn't get it, but I do get it. Beautiful. You, imagine you wake up and you look out your back window and you see the shoreline. Uh, when you look out your front windows, all you see is ocean in front of you. So and you can see the sun rising out of the ocean, uh, above the ocean, and it, it probably is very stunning. However, you are building your home on a big sandbar. So all it really takes is lots of wind and lots of waves, and that sand gets washed away, kind of like we talked about with longshore uh, drift. Uh, that could get washed away during a hurricane, for example, and now your home, your multi-million dollar home, is worthless because it's washed away or the island itself, the barrier island is not there anymore. So um, barrier islands, long, narrow, uh, parallel to the shore. Parallel just means it runs right along with it in the same direction as the shoreline. Um, but these are created because of waves. And that's what this whole section 5.3 talks about is how things are created by waves and wind. And so sandbar, they're created because of wind and or excuse me, of waves or currents in water. Barrier islands are the, created by the same way, waves and, and currents in the water. Um, wind can also shape land. Um, uh, one thing that can be created is called a sand dune or a dune. And some of you have actually been to state parks that have sand dunes. Uh, there's plenty along the coast uh, coastline of Lake Michigan. And uh, all, all a sand dune really is, is just a big mound of sand. Now, some of these sand dunes uh, can be monstrous. They can be two, 300 feet tall. Uh, that's a 20 or 30 story building tall. And they all start, and this is the pretty cool thing about sand dunes, they all start with just one grain of sand. Just one, that's it. And um, then they build up over time. One grain of sand stops. Maybe it hits a, a rock, or maybe it hits a, 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 maybe the, the carcass of a dead animal or a fish or something. And that one grain of sand stops right there. And then another grain of sand hits it and stops. Now you got two, and then another one. Now you got three, and then another one, you got four. And eventually you have trillions or quadrillions of uh, grains of sand that build up because the wind blows them there. Um, so uh, wind is a little bit less powerful than water uh, when it comes to erosion because wind can only carry certain amount. Uh, wind can't carry boulders. Uh, wind can carry sand particles and those sand particles will get dropped off. So, um, and when I show you the when I give you the assignment that has all the videos about sand dunes and, and such, um, you will see how sand dunes actually form. So, and how that actually shapes land. Uh, there are sand dunes in, in deserts. There are sand dunes not in deserts. Uh, they're finding that the Sahara Desert in, um, in Egypt uh, is moving. And as it's moving, it's, showing civilizations that existed that were buried by the desert. So um, that's a pretty cool thing to find out. Uh, they're finding so, uh, villages and homes and, and civilizations that were once thriving and the desert moved and covered it. And then now it's moved some more and now it's not covering it. So um, that's pretty cool. And then there's something called um, uh, Lois. Uh, Lois is a 
just a type of sediment. Uh, it's a soil. Uh, it's really fine. And by fine, I mean really tiny, tiny pieces. It almost feels like a pile of dust. Uh, and uh, that gets blown around near shorelines. Uh, and when it gets deposited, uh, it, it, it really becomes quite a valuable resource because it has such good soil, such good nutrients in that particular material, uh, which is one of the reasons why um, there is, there's good farming along the shorelines and probably a factor in why uh, people colonized the United States along the, the East Coast and we're able to be fairly successful along that East Coast is because of this type of uh, buildup of materials uh, because of wind. Wind would carry this fine material. And, and I'll, again, in that next assignment that I give you, um, it'll have some videos on how this forms and what it's like and what it looks like. And then the last thing that you'll write down today, I believe, is something called desert pavement. And you'll see this more near deserts, um, not sandy deserts, but uh, deserts where uh, the ground is actually um, almost like a rock. So what happens here is that uh, the wind has blown away all the smaller particles, all the little bits of sand and and. and and silt and clay and that kind of stuff. That's all been blown away and it leaves just stones behind, gravel, sized particles that the wind can't pick up and move. Uh, and when you get to an area of desert pavement, um, and you can kind of see this in your book on page 163. On page 163, um, you can kind of see, and I'll, I'll put it up there and I'll, I'll show you a couple. A um, couple things. If you if you turn to page one sixty three, uh, you'll see this as well. But make sure I get the right camera. Page one sixty three. You see that desert type pavement. Uh, that's because all of the the finer materials have been blown away. All those uh, smaller pieces have been carried away and dropped off someplace else. Uh, leaving behind just a, a, a rocky surface that's not really good for much of anything um, as far as what, um, as far as planting or anything like that, it becomes almost a useless uh, soil or useless ground to, to try to grow on. So, and I think that's that. Yep. So, um, like I said, I will, I, I will have another assignment coming up in a day or two uh, that will that will show all of the examples of all of these things that and hopefully you'll get a better picture a better idea um, i normally have the videos in here uh, i just can't have them in in these videos because i can't stream it legally uh, i can put it in a document and have you go but i can't live stream some of this stuff so um, that'll be just kind of like we've done in section 5.1 and 5.2 already so now as far as what you have to do for today's assignment, uh, in, in your um, assignment notebook, you wrote down, you wrote down that, well, I got a lot of stuff going on here. Um, you wrote down that you had to do page 163, one through four. Um, well, here are those questions. And so this is what you will, you'll get a document like this in your Google Classroom that you need to figure out. It says, what are four landforms that longshore drift and longshore currents produce? Um, so if you go back into your notes, um, if I can find them, oh, I was in them, duh. Um, when you look at longshore currents, what are some things that, that are made? You can see in your notes, uh, here's something and here's something. Um, and then in your book on page 159 and 160, uh, they talk about more things 
for that. So, um, and then the second question, how do dunes form? Third question, how does Lois form and why is it important? And is longshore drift the cause or the effect of longshore current? So you have to think about what each one is. Longshore drift is the movement of the sand and the beaches down shoreline. Longshore current is the uh, direction in which the wind is blowing the water that carries the sand. So you have to figure out, is longshore drift the cause or the effect of that current? So that's either going to be a cause or an effect, and then you have to explain your answer. So uh, the rest of the time is yours. Uh, I uh, Hopefully most of that got covered. As always, if you have questions, you can ask me, send me an email. Uh, send me an email more than a, a Google Classroom uh, comment. I, I see the emails first. And then the second thing is I just want you to uh, know that use your book. If, if some of the things in the notes aren't there, um, you should definitely... Um, Definitely use your book. I'm going to change this to two instead. So, anyway, uh, other than that, I have nothing else, and uh, that's it. So, have a